Welcome back AP Calc BC students for our final video covering topic 10.9. We're going to discuss the ramifications of a conditionally convergent series. Well, these are the facts. We've talked about how alternating series can sometimes absolutely converge, which is the same kind of convergence that we've really discovered through almost every other series test that we've used, or the alternating series could conditionally converge. But really, what does it mean to conditionally converge? Is it like a kind of converge type of thing? Well, yeah, but there's a little bit more to it. And it all has to do with what happens if you rearrange the terms of a infinitely conditionally convergent series. So let's take a look. So <clears throat> let's say we have a finite sum. Like we're adding the numbers 1 plus 3 minus 2 plus 5 minus 4. Now that is a series that consists of both positive and negative values that we're adding together essentially, which means that it could come under the realm of conditional convergence if it were mapped out uh, over an infinite stretch. But one fact remains. If we took that finite sum and re rearranged the order of the numbers, letting the signs travel along with them, that would not change the value of the sum. In other words, the commutative property is alive and well with that particular sum. But that's not necessarily true when you have an infinite series. It will depend on whether the series is absolutely convergent or conditionally. And basically, if you have a conditionally convergent, rearranging the terms could give a different sum? How is that even possible? Well, we're going to investigate that right about now. So mathematicians have shown that the alternating harmonic series, which you have now seen quite a few times, will actually converge to the natural log of 2. Now, I can show that to you to an extent with the graphing calculator. And I will do that right now. But I might have to take a little bit of hand waving to make this happen. Let me show you what I mean. First of all, let's get a nice decimal approximation for the natural log of 2. So we'll basically call it this 0.693. Now, if I try to do something clever and say, well, hey, let's go in here and let's Treat, tr uh, try to type in this notation. So we'll let n uh, uh, start with 1 and go to infinity, uh, the infinity symbol right down here. And then we're talking about negative 1 to the, and I'll really use the n plus 1 in, in this case. Um, and then we'll multiply by 1 over n which basically means I could just put that all over in for simplicity's sake. Now, if I try to hit enter here, I'm going to get some bad stuff. It, the calculator is really struggling with this. It doesn't understand what this is going to do. And it's basically, we, we've got something that's a little bit too robust for the calculator. Even though it mentions this non-real result, it's more of a result that goes way into the upper stratosphere of infinity that it's going to struggle with. Hey, it happens. But what I can do is maybe give me a redo here, and maybe I can just say, well, let's not let this thing go all the way up to infinity, but maybe up to, say, 100. And then I'll put a decimal point in there and see if this gives me a result. And it does, 0.688. Hmm. How about I try this again, but maybe take it up to 1,000? That's got to be closer to infinity, right? And I get 0.692. Mm hmm. All right. How about 10,000? 0.693. How about 100,000? Okay, 0.693 with a little bit more accuracy. I'm going to go one more. I don't want to press my luck, but by adding six zeros, that would be one million. And the calculator's thinking. I just hit enter. It took about three seconds, and I got 0.693147. Now, I'm going to stop there because I don't want to press my luck, but I think this 0.693147 is pretty darn close to this natural log of two. In fact, they match fairly perfectly through about 
six decimal places. So if I can get rid of these lines here, we can probably, uh, let's do that. Let's go down here and get rid of all of these middle lines. And then I can just show you basically those two on top of each other. Pretty darn good. Okay, so we're convinced that this infinite series does indeed add to natural log of two. Let's go back and rearrange the terms. Well, okay. Well, Mr. Record, what do you mean by rearrange the terms? Well, let's go ahead and we'll start with this summation. The summation where n begins with 1, goes up to our infinity, negative 1 to the n, or n plus 1. It really doesn't matter because you get the same, uh, basically the same sum in this case. And we end up with, let's do this. Let's keep our 1 over 1 where it is, subtract 1 over 2, and then let's have some fun. Well, just what kind of fun am I suggesting? Well, let's do this. Let's denote any term that we're placing out of order with a blue color. So I've replaced the positive one-third term that should have come next with negative 1 over 4. But I'll put that positive 1 over 3 back in. Now, even though he's out of place, I'm going back to red to indicate that that would have been the next term that I should have placed in there anyway if I wanted to retain my original order. And I'm going to keep this up. So anytime that a term goes into a spot that we don't expect, I'll write him in blue. So you would think that the plus 1 over 5 should come next. Well, no, I, I'm going to put minus 1 over 6, and I'm going to follow that with a minus 1 over 8. Now, notice that any fraction that has an even denominator is going to have a minus sign in front by accordance to these signs. Okay. Now if I return back to red, I'm going to go ahead and put the plus 1 over 5 in there. Now notice my next term that I should be placing probably should be the plus 1 over 7. He's the one that should come next. Now nah, I'm going to jump to minus 1 over 10 and then throw in a minus 1 over 12 for good measure. Now I'll put that plus 1 over 7 in there. And I'm going to just keep doing this over and over and over. I suppose a minus 1 over 14. I'm going to go with him next instead of the 1 over 9 like we would have probably anticipated. And you guys, we're just going to keep this thing going. Now, the next thing that I'm going to do, and, and don't worry about why did I rearrange these terms in that particular order? Because you can actually rearrange them in a lot of different ways. This is just one way that I chose. Now, what I am going to do is I'm going to group some terms together. I am going to group these two together, skip over the minus 1 fourth, group these two guys together, skip over the minus 1 eighth, group those two together, skip over the minus 1 twelfth, group those together, and what I am going to do is I am going to add anything that's in the parentheses. Let's help me do that. So 1 minus a half, of course, is 1 half. Minus 1 fourth drops down. Plus 1 third minus 1 sixth. Well, this is essentially 2 sixths minus 1 sixth, which is 1 sixth, positive. Drop down my minus 1 eighth. Add 1 fifth minus 1 tenth would be positive 1 tenth. Drop down my minus 1 twelfth plus 1 seventh minus 1 fourteenth, I believe is going to be 1 fourteenth. And we're going to have a pattern very similar to this. You probably can pick up on what that pattern is going to be. Please note this whole time, I have not changed the value of this. I'm not trying to pull some trick on you. I am just simply following the rules of mathematics, grouping terms using the associative property, and then simplifying. Now, one thing that I notice when I get to this stage, I, I can factor out a common factor. I think every one of these terms looks like a one-half resides within them. So if we factor out a one-half, that would give us one minus one-half plus one-third minus one-fourth, I'm sure you see the pattern, 
plus one fifth, minus one sixth, plus one seventh, and this is going to go on forever. Okay. Now what? Well, now I actually start to look at the contents within these parentheses, and I think, boy, does that look awfully familiar. Where have I seen those terms before? And I will help you. They're up here. The same terms. I'll even highlight both groups in yellow to convince you. Now, in this particular depiction, I have a few more of them, but it still represents the same series. But there's still this stray one half out in front. So essentially what I have is one half multiplied by, what does all these add up to again? Natural log of two. But all of a sudden, I have one half times that natural log of two. So by rearranging the terms and doing nothing else, I've cut my answer in half. And that's weird. That's just weird. That's why we have to call this a conditionally convergent series because, yep, there's still convergence, but we have this issue where we violate the commutative property and we need to acknowledge that in some way, shape, or form. And calling this a conditionally convergent is one way to do that. Now, I want you to know that there are other th ways to rearrange the sum, the sum. And depending on what way you decide to rearrange, you might get different answers. You might get different fractional factors of that natural log of two. And that's something that you can play with on your own if you feel motivated enough to do so. But really, the purpose of this video was just to make sure that you understood this idea of conditional convergence. Honestly, what you just saw me do right here is, is something that I don't require my students to replicate on an exam. It's certainly not going to appear on your AP Calculus BC exam, but I wanted you to see additional versions in action. I hope this helps out. We'll see you next time.